Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Al Fadi, and uh, welcome back to the series on understanding Islam, which is part of our uh, bigger topic that uh, uh, or section of uh, political Islam. Uh, with me here in studio, our dear friend Dr. Bill Warner, and uh, Bill, you and I have been really discussing a lot of interesting thing when it comes to how can someone who you mentioned high schooler maybe uh, mm-hmm. uh, you know or or even someone who does not have access to the primary sources of Islam in its original language, the Arabic, is it possible for them to know something about Islam? And I I think what we have demonstrated so far that it's, yes, you could, provided you do it this way. You read about the life of Muhammad. You uh, go ahead and read the Quran. You also read the sayings and the teachings of Muhammad. But also you need to understand the chronology of how these things were, were revealed. The content is also important. And that will lead me today to discuss a number of things. You last time talked about what we called or you called the trilogy, which is the three sources. The Quran, the life of Muhammad, biography, Sirah, mm-hmm. and the sayings of Muhammad. I would like for us today to discuss some of the contents that you found to be troubling in these sources. And and in a little bit, we are going to show a slide to back up what you said. And also, I would like for us to talk also about the different point of views in terms of what everybody will tell you about Islam. And finally, when it comes to the Quran, can you talk a little bit more about the translation of the Quran itself into English, for instance, in this case? So let's start with the uh, you know, contents, the troubling contents that you found in these sources, the trilogy. Well, the most troubling thing I found about the trilogy was the J word. Jihad. The jihad, okay. The jihad. Yeah. I mean, this is like, I was, I thought my other thought it would be more subtle. But no, it's, it's in your face. It's full force on. So that was, uh, and so I, of course, being, once I discovered there was a topic called jihad, I had to measure it. Being a scientist, I always want to measure it. And so what I did was I took the Quran, the Sirah, the Hadith, and I pulled out every verse and every sentence that had to do with jihad, which turns out to be very easy to do. And so we then see that one of the things I did this for is that some people say, well, it's a verse or two. Jihad is a verse or two. Wrong answer. Could we show the slide, please, you know, uh, so that it goes along with your explanation? And keep going, please. Okay. So this is jihad. 21% of the hadith is about jihad. This now, this is Bukhari or all the hadith? Just, just, just Bukhari. 21% of 7,000 hadith. Do right. the math, folks. Do the math. 1,400. Yeah, at least. At least <laughs> on jihad. Then we get to the sirah. 67% of the sirah is about jihad. Now, when I say that, this measures Muhammad's life as a prophet. As a prophet, 24%. I'm sorry, 67% is about jihad. This is not a verse or two. This is basically the whole book. And by the way, 67% on jihad since he was 40 years of age until he died 63. So in 23 years as a prophet, 67% of his modeling to the community focused on jihad. May I also add that the first 13 years he did nothing? So 67% was in the last 10 years of his life? Yes. Yes. What does that tell you about the urgency of jihad? Well, it's very urgent. But what we see also is jihad comes in steps. That is, at first, when Islam is introduced to a society, it is the religion of peace that's introduced that way. That's stage one, we call it. Right, right. stage one. And then it changes. And it changes to, let's go back to here. In the Quran, 24% of the Quran written in Medina is about jihad. 0% is in Mecca. So it says that Islam is the religion of peace in Mecca. But... 24% 24% of the Medina and Quran is about jihad. That means it is not a verse or two. This is a systemic doctrine. That's right. And by the way, um, I wrote an article, believe it or not, on Answering Islam that deals with is Islam or the concept of jihad uh, truly uh, you know, absent from the Meccan you know, uh, passages. And what you discover is that it was an undercover doctrine the threat was, oh, God is going to punish you, okay? Right. I mean, I got nothing to do with you. God is going to punish you. But later That's you understand right. God is going to punish you was just I'm buying time until I figure out how God is going to punish you now. 
Well, the other thing is, Mecca is about the fact that, by the way, Mecca is filled with descriptions of hell. I mean, I was astounded how many descriptions of hell there are, and I, some of the best writing in the Quran is descriptions of hell. So I was struck with that. Now, here's what's interesting. In Medinan Quran, there's not much mention of hell, because I'm going to your point. In Mecca, God's going to punish you, but in Medina, Muhammad will punish you. And Muhammad says, by the way, in the Quran, and uh, uh, the Quran would say, this punishment is God's punishment, but he's using you as an agent. Right. You're doing yeah. God's work when you cut off his head. Yeah, that's why the war is called Fisabilla in a way of God, technically speaking. I'm, I'm just doing what God wants. In fact, one of the passages in the Quran says, uh, you know, fighting is prescribed for you and you hate it. You hate it. You don't but like you it. But you have to, you know? It doesn't other... matter whether you like, <clears throat> like it or not. You're supposed to do this. Exactly. Exactly. So so that's, you know, that's fascinating because let's go back to the slide. I want to show a couple of things. You know, so when you were talking about Meccan have a zero mention of commands to fight. Right. That's the that's the phrase when I use it. It went through stages as Bill mentioned. First phase was, or stage, you know what? Um, it's it's not prescribed for you. You know, you're just gonna have to wait. And then you get to now you can do self defense. Right. If you're attacked, you have the right to attack. Then it came to after that. Well, if they attack you, defend yourself, but go after them as well. Right. But the last one is the most troubling one because now it's open ended. Mm -hmm. It's prescribed, not described. Prescribed, like writing a doctor prescription. If you want Islam to be the dominant religion, you must fight against anyone and everyone in a way. And that's the part that many today miss. Let's discuss something. <clears throat> because we've got the good stuff and the bad stuff, but what happens to, let's call it, look, the Arabs of Muhammad's day pointed out, look, you said something different last year. So it's not, these contradictions are not subtle. Correct. And, and then some, some of his own companions were like, but that's not what you told us earlier. Exactly. Yeah. Well, the Quran, I think there's three verses which work out this detail, and they work it out this way. That which is latter, that is later in date, is, <clears throat> is better and stronger than that which was earlier. That's the doctrine of obligation. Yes. Notice what it does not say. It does not say that the earlier was wrong. It says what came, better, what came later was better and stronger. Correct. So this means that the Meccan Quran can always be used. It's Correct. It's not trashed. <clears throat> but the stronger verse is the latter verse. Yeah, and, and you, two examples of these passages, by the way, that uh, uh, set the foundation for the doctrine of abrogation. What, what does abrogation mean? Meaning you cancel the ruling of something and replace it with what Bill mentioned, the better ruling right now. Uh, rule of thumb, later, usually going to stand against what was earlier. Chapter 2, verse 106, for instance, is an example. Chapter 16, verse 101. These are at least two examples of those. So the contradictions in the Quran are inherent. That is, they can't be worked out in the sense of we'll make the contradiction go away. And this brings us something very interesting about the Quran and the rest of Islamic doctrine, which is it is contradictory. I call this dualism, in which you have two things that contradict each other, but they're both simultaneously true. Islam is the religion of peace. Islam is the politics of jihad. Those contradict each other. Doesn't matter. They're both equally true and to be used when needed. Correct. Absolutely. That's fascinating. So, Bill, uh, you know, you and I have interacted about this, and, and uh, you mentioned, and uh, you know, rightly so, that there are different views mm. on how to understand Islam. Why don't you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, I hold that there are three views on Islam. The, the Islam of the believer, the Muslim. There is the Islam of the apologist, and there is the Islam of the kafir, that is, those who actively reject. And these three points of view can be illustrated. There was a day in Medina when several hundred Jews had their heads cut off. Now, there's three points of view on this. The point of view of the non-believer, the kafir, is that was horrid. That was a war crime. That's one view. The view of the apologist is, well, that was then. This is now. Uh, all kinds of cultures have trouble in their past. Then there's the other one, which is it is a day of glory because Allah has triumphed over the perfidious Jews. So these three views cannot be reconciled. And so therefore, you can, you can be in one of the three camps, but they won't be reconciled. What is important is that you understand all three points of view. 
That is, when you're listening to the NPR, New York Times, Apologist for Islam, you need to understand that this is an apology that does not accept the full force of the truth of Islam. So there these, I call them the three views of Islam. Now, which view will be the supreme view? Well, it depends on how much time we lay. The law of saturation says, in the end, the, belie- the rule of the believer will reign, because history teaches us that. Right. And usually, uh, you know, I, I, I mean, to add to what you just said, uh, it's, it's one thing if your Muslim neighbor said something about how to interpret, you know, the story. I mean, you heard the story. Uh, there were an entire Jewish tribe that was literally annihilated. Their, uh, uh, you know, basically their men were beheaded overnight. They built even a trench so that they will throw them in there. And uh, they would even start with the, uh, at the age of puberty, in fact, they asked the lads, you know, the young kids to uh, undress sure. themselves to make sure is their hair, you know, uh, pubic hair or not, that, that will tell them that they are already at that age and they will be hit him. I mean, we're talking 12, 13, 14 uh, age, uh, I mean, uh, um, old, um, young men. I know some of you are troubled by this. I mean, imagine if it was done by any other group other than Islam, most of you will be outraged, but sadly, nobody talks about these issues. And I remember one time I brought it up, Bill, and I said, you know, 900, and a well, Muslim chised, uh, you know, chastised me and said it was 600. <laughs> As if that made it right. It's still troubling and problematic, right. you know. Right. There is different views. There is 600 and there is not. That's not the point. The point <laughs> is why do it anyway, you know. Right. It's like when you talk about wife beating, they tell, oh, wife beating lightly. Why beat the wife in the first place? You know, when we talk about women, we need to address this. Right. So all that to say is you ask your neighbor, he may tell you something, but unfortunately your neighbor is not the authority on Islam, by the way. Guess who's the authority on Islam? First, the trilogy. You know, you have to see what does the Quran say about this? What does the Hadith and Muhammad's own saying? And how did Muhammad practice something like this? That's his seerah. But then you have the scholars of Islam, the learned ones. Do they agree with your neighbor? The chances are they don't. And that's what is so confusing sometimes to people in society. They hear one thing, but they don't understand why others are doing what they did. Let's use ISIS as an example. Perfect example. Was ISIS following Islam perfectly? I've read, I think their magazine was called The Beak. Um, I think so. I, I, um, anyway, they had, a, they had a web-based magazine. Good graphics, clear writing, well done, and you had, for instance, I remember they did a whole topic on sex slaves. And they said, well, say, they say that sex slaves is not part of Islam. And they said, well, yes, it is. And they go through, and it was the best article I've ever read on sex slavery. For instance, because I learned, they're Islamists. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they, for instance, one of the things I learned, which I did not know, was that all of Muhammad's companions, with the exception of one, had sex slaves. So it was, a, it was a, I guess, a favorite indoor sport. I mean, yeah, you have Muhammad, you have his companions that lived with him who practiced what the leader practiced, right. basically. So yeah. if they were practicing this, you better believe it was right to do because Muhammad was living in the same town as they were doing. So, uh, yep, it's, it is in the doctrine. Let's be clear about, repeat something we've said before. If you read it in Muhammad, his traditions are his history, and if you read it in the Quran, then it is Islam no matter if a Muslim said it is not. And by the way, I have a comment to make. I say I don't usually discuss Muslims, but I have noticed this. Most Muslims don't know that much about Islam. They know how to practice it. That is, they know the, how to do the prayers and stuff. But when it comes to the actual subject of Islam, I've been amazed how little they do know. That's true, because they take it by faith. I mean, they're, yes. they're, they're just culturally, they observe their family do something, or the government where they live, they do something, or the imam at the mosque said something. So they feel like, okay, I'm being told, that's it, you know, I'll go along with it. Don't need to know anymore. Exactly. And, and that's why you find different forms of Islam. If you go to Central Asia, the form of Islam is a little different than when you find it, for instance, in the Middle East. And even in the Middle East, the Islam in Saudi is different than Islam in, in Egypt or the Islam in North Africa. And that's why many times Muslims, sometimes they will say, well, you know, uh, being from Saudi, it seemed like, you know, you guys are the model for Islam because that's the land. I would agree. Yeah. I would agree. Yep. If I were going to be a Muslim, I'd be a Salafi. Why? Because they follow without flinching what is actually in the Quran, the Sirah, and the Hadith. That's right. 
That's right. Well, Bill, I mean, this has been an exciting, at least introductory, uh, you know, series. We called it Understanding Islam. You can tell that there is a lot to be taught. And obviously, we want to revisit, you know, some of these topics. Like, for instance, we want to dedicate some uh, videos and episodes only on a trilogy alone. I mean, what is the Sira? What is the Quran? What is the Hadith? But uh, in the interest, at least, of this particular, uh, you know, uh, time, uh, we want to dedicate more videos for other topics. Uh, Bill, um, I think the topic of women in Islam is Let's one of next. those, um, you know, very timely and important. And we would like to do a number of those videos on that. So thank you for agreeing to uh, be with us uh, to record such a thing. I know it's a tough topic, by the way. It's no, no matter how hard we try to uh, make it politically correct, it's still going to be a hot topic. So that's kind of like my gentle warning <laughs> to to the viewers, you know, uh, viewer discretion is, <laughs> is advised, basically. So thank you again uh, for being with us. And thank you to all of you for watching. And until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video. And we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.